Welcome to Mac Voices. This is the Talk of the Mac community, and I'm Chuck Joyner. This time I'm pleased to have on Mike Hardacre, the developer of 645 Pro for the iPhone, a camera app that I've come recently to know and really love. Mike, welcome. It's great to have you on the show. Hi, it's great to be here. Mike, you know, there's so many camera apps out there for the iPhone, especially for the iPhone, some for the iPad, and all of them claim to do some really great things. I'm not a photographer, as anyone who listens to the show know, but I really found 645 Pro to be different. Um, For someone at my camera uh, picture-taking level, I found I can get better better photos out of it. What kind of magic have you done that lets even me get better photos? Um, well, I don't know if it's magic, uh, but the real focus is, which I think is somewhat unusual with, with, with iPhone camera apps, the focus is actually on, on the camera. Uh, I think that the bulk, of, the bulk of the camera apps you see out there, the focus is on actually post, post-processing in one form or another, and or the, or the process of acting, people having a lot of fun taking a recognizable picture and turning it into something very, very different. Uh, and I mean, I've, I've been interested in cameras and photography since uh, a long time before, you know, since the days when digital meant using your fingers. And um, I actually like, I like analog. I like the simplicity of buttons and levers and things like that. Um, but, um, but I also adore digital. And so I'm really interested in, in the thing as a camera as distinct from being a starting point for a lot of processing. So what we really looked at was looked at how the different, how the hardware could be pushed to its limits. Really, was was one of the things. Uh, so providing ways of getting the metering better. We then looked at sort of the output quality and pushed that pretty hard. So there are some tricks that it's not really magic. It's just a question of reading the documentation that Apple provides for its APIs and saying, I wonder what happens if I do that. Instead of just saying, well, we'll press the button, take a picture, and then the fun starts. Uh, but it's actually saying, what can we actually do with the hardware? And there's a handful of developers that are taking that kind of approach, and we're, we're very proud to be in that group. Uh, so the other thing was to actually look at cameras from the point of view of interface design, because I think that you know people have been making pretty easy to use cameras for 100 years, and they've learned a lot. And I think to try and reinvent the design of the camera is a little bit challenging. I and mean, it's often you can take good ideas from real cameras. So I mean, if I reach across to my little table of props, something like this is even older than me. It's a little Leica M3. And there are some things on there that just work, that work really well. And so there are also things on digital cameras. Guys such as Canon and Nikon have been making great cameras for decades. And they've learned a lot about the user interface. Photographers are used to that kind of user interface. So we brought more of those ideas in and fewer, if you like, fewer influences from software design. So I think that's, it's that sort of combination of things. It behaves like a camera a little bit more, bearing in mind it is, of course, still a touchscreen app. But also the focus is on the photographic output rather than it being the opening stage of producing some admittedly really wild images out there. But, but we're doing something different and, and maybe that's why, because I think up to this point, I'd always thought, okay, we have the camera, we have this many megapixels, we have this lens, we have these limitations, it's going to spit out in JPEG format, and you're right, then it's all about post-processing. But without playing with any of the post-processing, without even playing with some of the options in 645 Pro, I got some really amazing shots. In fact, in, in some cases, I get shots better than my normal point-and-shoot, which is not a $99 point-and-shoot. Well, I think one of the things is that the, the actual camera hardware for a device, is, considering how small iPhone is, the camera hardware is not bad, particularly in the 4S. Um, but the thing is, one of the things that we did is there's a standard way of doing camera apps, and the bit that everybody thinks is easy is easy because you go out, you register as an Apple developer, and you go and get Apple sample code, and you basically do the bits of taking the picture exactly the same as the sample code, and then you start processing. Uh, And what we did was actually break that right down and say, well, look, the standard approach takes a picture and then delivers the developer a JPEG to play with. And we said, well, is there another approach? And it turned out there was. We could actually get the, it wouldn't be correct to call it the raw data because it's been through some processing, but we could actually get an un-JPEG bitmap to start our processing with. 
And since then, a couple of other people have, have found the same sort of tricks. And I know that the next version of Mapbox, for example, is being developed with very similar thinking. But because we don't start with a JPEG and then process it and recompress it as a JPEG, we're able to get better quality output, essentially. Because each, uh, uh, whether you're a camera guy or whether you've worked with Photoshop or, in fact, if you've worked with web images, you'll know that each time you compress a JPEG, you actually bring some quality loss into the equation. So if you can reduce the numbers of times you have to do that, you get better pictures. Mike, talk a little bit about the format that that you take the photos in, that you save them by camera roll in. It's not something that I personally was familiar with, which probably shows my lack of photographic expertise. Well, the, we essentially we save in three different formats, which is two levels of JPEG compression, one of which is pretty close to the standard iPhone camera, and the other one is with much less compression, so therefore fewer artifacts hit the picture. Uh, the second one is something that we call D-RAW, um, and essentially those are TIFFs that have had no processing applied beyond the stuff that happens really at the firmware level uh, on, on iPhone. And the reason we call them DRAW is because TIFF is just a file format. You can have anything in a TIFF, really. Um, but we wanted to actually tell people that are used to the DSL, DSLR world where it is in the, process that the processing cycle that they're used to. So typically what happens with a DSLR is you take a, a raw image, which is the actual sensor data, and then you take that into a piece of software such as Adobe Photoshop Lightroom or dedicated software that came with the camera, and you develop it. And essentially, in, in many cases, that simply means applying the default white balance and sharpening and ISO settings that were present on the camera when you took the picture, but you have an opportunity to tweak those if you got your ISO wrong or your white balance wrong. And you end up with a TIFF, which has been developed from the raw photo. And what we're saying is that our TIFFs are at an equivalent stage of rawness to those images. So that they're, um, you know, they're a little bit more cooked than a raw image, but they're as native as you can get out of the hardware in its current status with the current Apple APIs. So if you want as pure an image as possible to process, particularly on the desktop where you've got tools, the frank, there are some great iPhone development and processing apps, but you don't have the granularity of control that you get if you're using something like Photoshop CS6. So if you want the best possible starting point for that image, then this provides you with, with that image. And so we call it D-RAW to, to, to tell you that it's beyond, it's later in the cycle than RAW, but it's as close as we can get. And it, the D-RAW files do go to my camera roll? No, but there are two ways that they can go, actually. Yes, they can go to your camera roll. That's an option. Um, generally, the standard approach, if you don't change any of the settings, they go to the documents directory of the app, and then they can be copied across to the desktop using iTunes file sharing. Uh, but there is an option in the settings menu to save them to the camera roll. Um, there are pros and cons. Saving to the camera roll they, is a smaller physical file because it has non-lossy LZW uh, compression applied in order to get a file that camera roll can actually handle. Camera roll does not like 23 megabyte images. It uh, responds badly to trying to save that sort of thing. Um, the other thing is saving to camera roll is actually slower than saving to the local folder. So you can actually save a TIFF in about three and a half seconds to the app's own directory, um, but saving to camera roll is more like seven seconds for the, for the same image. So you get the access on your camera roll. Uh, if you, for the handful of apps that can actually process TIFFs, you can then process those TIFFs directly from the camera roll. And equally, the camera roll is easy to access from tools such as Lightroom or iPhoto or Aperture. Um, against that, you've got actual, a much swifter process uh, by saving them to the local folder. And they're easy enough to copy across to a desktop using iTunes file sharing. And you just said 23 megs. Is that the kind of file size we're talking about here that, uh, that this takes? Oh, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, for, a, for an iPhone 4S, it's an, it's an 8 megapixel camera. So um, RGB, 888, eight, eight, that's 20, you know, that's 24 megabytes. Whereas, in fact, there's a little bit of compression that takes place in there, even with an uncompressed TIFF. And, yeah, so you're talking an uncompressed file of 23 megabytes. Okay, so... You're going to dedicate your iPhone to a lot of photo taking if you use this app, but that's a good thing because you get great results. 
Yeah, I mean, you've got to, I mean, you generally you're going to be saving that quality of image if you're going to be wanting to process for, really for print use. For most people, that the extra that you get from the totally uncompressed image is irrelevant because the thing's never being seen on anything bigger than a sort of a thousand pixel wide image uh, on the web. Uh, but for people that do print, or for people that are using are using the iPhone as a professional tool, and increasingly photographers are either choosing to do that because of the the elegance of it in in a lot of circumstances. I mean, it's 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 you can be very discreet with an iPhone, uh, and if you're but if you're taking pictures that are going to end up in in print in a magazine, then you want the best possible quality because actually it's pretty unforgiving when you. Uh, when it's being printed at 300 dpi on glossy paper. And that's pretty unforgiving, but much more unforgiving is the typical picture editor that is not impressed by getting uh, sort of compressed JPEGs. They like to see good quality original images. So it, it gives photographers a tool for where quality really is key. Most of the time, I would suggest that people actually shoot JPEGs. They're still going to get very high quality images, uh, and they're going to take up less of their, uh, their iPhone storage. Mike, it just really intrigues me that we haven't seen this before or heard about this. It seems like with all the discussion of iPhone camera quality, which has been very, very, very positive, this takes it to a whole new level. And as far as I know, you're the first that actually bothered to do it or, or bothered to look at those specs that you were talking about and act, actually create something for that next level of photographer or someone who wants to really push it to the limit. I, well, we are. The, as far as I know, we're, the, we're absolutely the first. So there's at least one more app now out there that is saving tips, but I don't know if it's following the same process as, as we are to do that. I think it comes down to a variety of factors. Uh, firstly, the the idea of being able to take decent photographs with an iPhone is, is relatively new. Um, and it really was only with the iPhone 4 that the camera quality became comparable with decent point and shoots. I think the 3GS is not quite there, the 4 is, the 4S is better still. And so it was only with the iPhone 4, with uh, iOS 4 uh, as well, that you got developers starting to actually play more seriously with the iPhone camera, rather, rather than treating it as, as almost a gimmick, as a toy. So that, that's only, I mean, it's less than two years really. Uh, it takes time to develop this stuff, and priorities are going to be on markets that people know and understand. And again, a lot of iPhone photography developers are coming from a, if you like, a relatively light-hearted approach. They're not necessarily coming from a photography background. Um, I launched my first app uh, in May last year, which was called 6x6. And what I was trying to do there was actually not be focused on lots of filters, but actually to have something that was simple to use, elegant, looked classic in a way and therefore help people to take better pictures because it was, it was almost, they cared more about it. it. It gave them grids and this sort of stuff to look at. And, and a side effect of that was I ended up with a market for, for that and for subsequent cameras that included professional photographers who would write to me and say, can I have this, can I have that, can I have that? And can you do anything about the image quality? We want it better, we want it higher. So possibly because I had that audience, I was getting feedback that was different to a lot of other developers, which drove me to see what I could do. So uh, I think that, and, and I mean, let's, let's be honest, what, what we do is, is a niche. If you look at the sales chart for iPhone cameras, um, we're typically in the top 50, but uh, depending on territory, but we're not sitting there in the top 10. Now, what we're doing is a relatively niche product, and most developers... I would suspect to take a look at the top 10 apps and say, how can we beat them? Whereas I, I take the view that the iPhone world is large enough that actually there's a lot of fun and potentially profit to be had for actually working some of the margins. You're, you're clearly doing it. Go back for a second, though, and talk about the interface, because you don't just have a, a standard camera interface. You give me the option of several camera backs, which I thought was very intriguing, again, not being a regular photographer. Well, that was to, that was really to have a bit of fun. You can with six forty five Pro, you can basically you can switch the look a little bit. It's it's in a sense it's, it's similar to Hipsomatic, where you can get you know you can buy new new camera bodies. Uh, and that was just, that was partly to have a bit of fun, but it's partly because the standard look of six forty five Pro is extremely sort of classic and austere and black and sort of it's got black grey buttons on a black background, but it's. 
And if you're used to shooting a DSLR or if you're used to older, you know, analog SLRs or such as cameras, it's a very familiar look and feel. But for other people actually like to have a bit of fun. So we gave an option where you get a, a bright scarlet one, which is a kind of a tip of the hat to Hasselblad's uh, Ferrari-themed um, medium format digital camera that they brought out uh, about six months ago, I think. It's actually Ferrari-sponsored. So you get this the normally incredibly sort of stolid Hasselblad and it's vivid for our red and it's brilliant so I thought it was quite fun to just do something similar to that you know m most of this is pretty serious but there's room for a little bit of whimsy and you do offer I think um, although I have not played with them some filtering options that some people might find interesting is that fun or is that serious uh, it's actually pretty serious I mean the at the core of it while you, we will the camera gives you the option of taking of getting these completely unprocessed uh, TIFF files. It's also got uh, seven different film modes uh, in it, which are designed to get as close as possible to replicating some, some classic film stocks. So they've got names that hint at what, uh, what they're trying to duplicate. But uh, clearly, if you, if you come from an analog background, one of the things you could do was you would, uh, if you were shooting black and white, you'd shoot... Uh, let's say Ilford FP4 if you wanted a very fine grain look for portraits, so or you'd go for Kodak Tri-X Pan for, uh, for a slightly grainier, more contrasty look. And in color, you, you know, Kodachrome had just very different uh, qualities to Velvia. And these were things, essentially what those are is they are a set of, a stack of predefined filters that affect the color, they affect the contrast, and they put actual film grain onto the images, and they give you a very film-like look, um, which, in a sense, is is almost the opposite of what we're doing elsewhere. Because there's there's something art there's artifice there, and it's retro. But actually, an awful lot of people think that film photographs look better than analog ones. It's just such a pain having to get the stuff processed. So um, it, it's it's actually reflecting what a lot of people just genuinely think looks better. And then on top of that. Uh, with, the, with the latest release, we introduced the ability to put, to if you like, adjust those with, with the equivalent of putting glass filters on the front of the lens. So you can actually change the way that the color balance is handled in black and white by, by putting an orange filter in front of the lens. Um, so depending on whether you want to make skies push or if you want the contrast of trees to be different, then you can use the filters to actually manipulate that and, and those you can see in real time on the viewfinder. You just swipe the viewfinder and things change. Equally if you're indoors but you don't want the if you if you don't like the way that the auto white balance on the camera has actually is handling the, the particular light temperature that you're in, you can use filters to make the image cooler or, or warmer. So it gives you a digital equivalent of the, the the kind of stuff that you would have in your bag with a DSLR, or or even more so with a with a film camera. Um, in a sense, it's it's a little whimsical, but it's actually all about trying to help people to get good photographs the way that they want them, uh, rather than manipulating those images in in, in too artificial. Way. It strikes me that this gives people an opportunity without investing those hundreds thousands of dollars in a DSLR and the filters and the lenses and all that. It gives them a chance to play with some of this, find out if they're willing to go through the process to get those effects, or whether they're just satisfied with taking the, the, the JPEG or even the, the better options that you have and playing with them in post to get something. Absolutely. I mean, in a sense, there's, there's, there's two audiences, I think, for, for, uh, for the app. And one of them is people that actually are familiar with these kind of tools and want to work the way that they've always worked and don't see why the fact that they're shooting with an iPhone should, should make life any different. And there is another market which, is, yes, it's an opportunity to, to play and to learn and to experiment. I mean, it's like, um, there's a lot of things like that on iPhone. I think it's brilliant. I mean, if you, if you want a great scientific calculator, you can go out and spend $100 on a, on a Hewlett-Packard scientific um, reverse Polish notation calculator that may be utterly incomprehensible to you, but it's a lovely piece of kit. But actually, you can buy a $5 app that, that will give you an RPN scientific calculator, and you can find out whether it's something you want to do. Uh, in many ways, it's more convenient because it's always in your pocket, but against that, it's actually 
not as necessarily as nice to use as, as the big the big physical thing sitting in your desk uh, with buttons that go down when you press them. So, yeah, I mean, it's it, it's a way of actually giving you a, a, a taste of that if, if, if you're new to it. And it, it's, it's quite striking. I've had a number of emails that have come into us that uh, people would say, you know, I'm actually so I've spent hours reading the manual because all of this is completely new to me. And you know, can you tell me where I can find out about um, spot metering? And so I'll go out and I'll find some good websites that have got introductions to actual core photography concepts because it's a tool that actually allows people that are used to taking snapshots to actually experiment with some of the more complex aspects of photography, which in the end then help them to think about the photographs that they're taking. Because ultimately photography, is, it, it, it's, it's expose and compose. You know, it's, it's point the thing in the right direction, get the light right. Um, and the more you think about those things, the better the photos you take, whatever tool you're using. You could be using a, a 60s Instamatic and you can take great photos if you actually worry about the light and the composition. So this camera actually makes it easier easier to think about those things, and so consequently you're more likely to take that bit of extra care. If you do that, hopefully you end up taking better pictures, because that's actually what it's about. It's, it's about taking good photographs. This is the first photo app in a long time that I've seen that makes me really want to go and learn more about photography. I think up to this point I've been sort of looking for the quick fix. I've been looking for, you know, what will take better, what filter can I put on it, what, how can I post-process it. This makes me appreciate a little more what a pro photographer or an advanced photographer goes through, the way their mind works, maybe, is the best way to say it. And you're right, makes me want to go and seek out some of this knowledge in a way that I really haven't had before. And I'm shocked that it's coming from an iPhone app. I don't know why it would be. I mean, the great thing about iPhone is that it is just such a, it's a platform to do practically anything. Um, and I think that it's... And in fact, to be perfectly honest, I, I'm a huge fan of those apps that do make it easy to make average photos look better. Because actually, for an awful lot of people, an awful lot of the time, you take a picture of something that happens quickly, and, and in fact, you realize you've backlit it, or you didn't get close enough, or you're too close, and you put the filters on, and the thing looks much, much more fun. It looks better, and that's brilliant, because that's helping people to have fewer lousy pictures. And hopefully 645 Pro is actually helping them in a different way. And I think there, you know, there, there are other apps out there that do help you to think. But, but I, I believe because it makes such a point out of what it's doing and because it's got an interface that says we're different. It's not, it's not an interface for everybody. Some people think that it's I – mean, I've, I've actually I've seen people online suggest that um, you know, it's, Steve Jobs would have taken one look at it and thrown it, thrown it in the trash, whereas uh, – <laughs> I personally disagree because I mean it's. I think that uh, while the Apple products the, themselves tend to be simple, they've actually made uh, what's made them successful is often having very complicated things sitting inside them. Whether it was when when I first started using Macs, it was Quark Express running on a sort of Mac SE, and I mean the SE itself was cute and simple, and Quark Express was mind-bogglingly complicated, and the combination was pretty good. And I think that, uh, you know, I mean, the Nexts were, uh, Nexts were not computers for beginners. I loved the Next Station. It was a fantastic little kid, but it was scary as hell once you <laughs> tried to do anything with it. Uh, and I think, there's, uh, I think there's room for all sorts of apps. And I think that, that one of the things is that, uh, one of the things I love about iPhone is that you don't have to try and make every app one size fits all. You can actually say... I recognize that 80% of people with an iPhone are, I don't want to use this app, but that's fine. And then you do another app for another segment and another slice of that market. And it, the ability to do that, I think, I think it's wonderful. Mike, why no iPad version? It's just not there yet, or is there some philosophical basis for it? There's a very good philosophical reason why I wanted to run on iPad 3, because iPad 3's got a perfectly good camera. Uh, essentially, the hardware requirements for the app say that it requires an autofocus camera. Uh, the primary reason for that is actually to stop people trying to run it on hardware that will actually be too slow, and they'll have an awful experience, and then they'll write horrid reviews and uh, vile emails and all of the stuff that inevitably happens. However, iPad 3, it should work on there. There's a problem uh, in iOS. The iOS fails to report to the App Store or to iTunes that the product, in fact, has got 
a, an autofocus camera. So it should install on an iPad 3. It doesn't. Uh, Apple knows about this. They say they're working on it. And allegedly, uh, it installs just fine if you're running the betas of iOS 6. Uh, that's some feedback that we've had that, it, that the problems. So I, I think there will be an iPad version, as in it will run, but it won't be a native iPad version, uh, a universal binary. Um, partly, I think that there are other ways of using the iPad real estate more, more interestingly. And I've got a couple of iPad apps. That we're, we're looking at some ideas for iPad. Um, also, it's really waiting for the numbers of new iPads out there in the wild to increase because, I mean, they're increasing very rapidly. But really, that, that, that's a proper photography platform. iPad 2 has got a pretty dreadful camera. I mean, it's, it's like iPod Touch. It's, it's, not a, it's not a good bit of kit. And for the sort of apps that we like to produce, you end up, whatever you want, producing quite lousy output. And that actually reflects badly on us. I don't, I don't think it does our brand that much good. So really, it's, it's, iPad 3 is, is a very interesting market. This product should be running on it. Um, and when Apple fixes its operating system, it won't be. So it's one of those blue things. Obviously, nobody bothered to check that particular combination of hardware requirements. And for whatever reason, it's just not, not quite right. Oh, but it's encouraging that iOS 6 betas are, are allowing it. So we all have something to look forward to. Yeah. No, uh, new iPad's great. Um, for photography, and uh, I'm surprised at how many people already I've seen actually out and about using them. I mean, I think that I, I find it a rather ungainly machine for, for lugging around and taking pictures, but others disagree with me, and uh, clearly they're right because they're taking good pics with them. So. I had that experience recently uh, on vacation. I was quite surprised at the number of people that were walking around with an iPad taking pictures. It just goes to show you that it, maybe it's a tool that you have with you. Maybe it's the larger screen that they feel they can see better as to what they're capturing. But And they, they weren't looking around like, I hope nobody's watching me. They were right out there in, in the front doing it. So I guess it just depends on, uh, on your individual biases. Absolutely. And I guess especially if you're on vacation and you've got your Kindle books on there and you've got your everything else, then... That's the thing you want to carry around me um, instead of squinting at the iPhone to do your holiday reading and stuff. How much is uh, 645 Pro? It's $2.99 or the equivalent in, in other territories. Okay, so this so, is a, a very, very affordable app, and especially for something that is a pro-level app for the iPhone in the area of photography. Well, I think it's a reasonable price. I mean, it, pr pricing is always an interesting issue with, with these kind of apps. Um, there are, there are a lot of people that will buy nothing unless it's 99 cents and will always seek for the free alternative. Um, there are some apps that do very nicely with, with higher price tags. I, I, I personally feel that once you get the, the three dollars is, is a reasonably comfortable price for something that is feature rich. Um, but it, it, it's always interesting doing that, uh, that balancing act as to how you should price something like this. So it's, uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think, I, I, know much, I, I know how much work went into it, so I think it's an entirely reasonable. <laughs> so, you know, when you consider that to buy, to buy a good point and shoot is going to cost you $300. Uh, so what the, this is actually bringing something extra to your iPhone camera. And, uh, I think that as such, it's, the, the price delta on top of the iPhone is, is pr pretty marginal. Well, they always say it's become now a piece of common wisdom that the best camera is the one you have with you. This just makes the best camera I have with me even better if I just spend this much time learning about it. And I'm sure it'll get better when I start spending that much time learning about it. Well, it's, it's, it's there precisely to do that. But equally, that doesn't mean that it has to be... What's great, for, again, what's great about the platform, it doesn't have to be the only camera app that you use. So it does, it rewards a little bit of patience. So if you're in a hurry and you want to take some snap, snap, snapshots, you switch to another app. And that's the great thing. I mean, it, it's... it's um, we don't have to be all things to all people all of the time, so we can focus on trying to do what we do well because there is so, so much variety out there. And so I, th I think that that's at the core of our philosophy. Is let's make this app do these things really well instead of trying to say, and we hope people never use another camera app, you know, that they're completely taken over by this. So we don't need to be like that. We don't, we don't need to take, you know, it's, it's not an operating system. It's, it's an app within a very complex ecosystem. 
Mike, obviously you're in the Mac App Store. What's, what's your website so people can go and they can learn even more about this app? Because this is not something I think that you really do justice to yourself as a, as a purchaser if you don't go and read up more about it and learn more about it. Well, sure. Um, well, the website is jagger, J-A-G dot G-R, which looks like that. Okay. <laughs> you were waiting for that, weren't you? <laughs> yes. Um, um, we're also on Twitter where we're Jagger Tweets. Um, but if, if you go to the website, there's um, obviously all the, uh, all the relevant product information. We also blog reasonably frequently about the product. Um, we're introducing a line of tutorials and so on. So we've started on that. So actually, the product itself does come with a 32-page PDF manual. It's built into the, the camera, if you like. But you can also download that or read that from the website. And, and we're going to be doing increasingly quite a few tutorials to actually take people through some, some of the areas of, of the app. Um, because people do respond well to that sort of thing. They like, you know, they like how-tos. So people want how-tos, we give them how-tos. Mike, I really appreciate the time uh, and you talking about it. I think it's a great app. It, it really has become my camera app of choice, and I'm not just saying that. Uh, it may not be as fast as some others, but the results are absolutely stunning compared to some of the other things out there. And folks, for two ninety nine, go check it out. I don't think you'll be disappointed. Well, thanks for your time. Mike, we'll talk to you again soon. When, when you get some of those other apps ready, let us know. Yeah, we'll do so. Absolutely. Well, thanks for, uh, thanks for being so generous about the app. I'm, I'm glad you like it. It's, it's clearly, it's designed to do something for you that has worked, so that's great. Folks, that's Mike Hardacre, the developer of 645 Pro for your iPhone. Again, go check it out. I'll have links in the show notes to everything, to Mike's website, and also to uh, his presences on the social network so you can contact him if you want to. Until the next time, Mac Voices is the talk of the Mac community. I'm Chuck Joyner. Thanks for watching. Mac Voices TV is part of the Mac Voices Group at macvoicesgroup.com. Advertising handled by Backbeat Media at backbeatmedia.com.